I'm very happy to welcome you from all over the world. I think there are people coming in now in the next minutes. And I'm very much pleased to welcome Rui Thyssen. Um, I have met him several times in Stockholm at the um, Waldorf University College, Waldorf Lehrer Hochschulen in Stockholm. It's a teacher training center, which is directly uh, connected to the Christopher Skolan in Stockholm. So an old Swedish Waldorf school founded very early. And um, he has a um, astonishing and very nice career um, in the background. He is a Waldorf teacher from his side and his professional, professional work is craft teaching. And he is very much specialized in book binding. So he's an expert in book binding. And besides that pathway of doing the crafts, he has done a very, very high level academic training too at Stockholm University. And a couple of years ago, he received his doctorate because he did a very, very brilliant study and um, empirical study about the importance of crafts and what does it, what, what is the outcome of that and how how is it received by the students and so on maybe you can say something yourself about it so i think this is a pillar of of what we are doing in wild of schools it's something very special that we focus on the crafts uh, so much and um, so it's wonderful to have a, an academic paper a doctorate um, which is a dissertation which is really dealing with that topic and of course i invited him to speak here at our um, um, International Campus Waldorf um, directly about that topic. If you're, um, when you are um, interested a bit more in, in the writings of Rui Tison, I would um, really like to recommend we have an online journal. Um, it's founded um, by um, the Scandinavian uh, teacher training centers and, and Alanos University together. And this online um, journal, it's called Rose, like the flower. And this is an acronym for Research on Steiner Education. So we were very happy when we found that acronym. So it is so, so um, um, good for what for, for this kind of work. And there you find um, for free download um, articles, academic articles, um, all around world of education. It's m mostly in, in, in German and in English. So it's translated in English or vice versa. And there's also a Spanish translation um, going on. So many articles in Spanish too. So if you um, have a look at the roastjourn.com, you will find that. Laura just put it into the chat. You can have a look at it. So Rui, I'm, I'm very happy to have you here and the stage is yours. Well, thank you, Jost. That was a great introduction. Uh, you covered about at least more than half of what I was going to say as an introduction of myself. So <laughs> sorry <can>, for that. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, it's much nicer to have someone else say it than than to say it myself. But uh, I I went to 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 the Christopher School. Went, so I, I'm a former Waldorf student, and that's where I come came into contact with bookbinding as a craft. And I was lucky enough that at the Christopher School at the time, Wolfgang Bremer worked, who was one of the foremost bookbinders in the world when he was vocationally active. So I stayed on after I had finished school and did my apprenticeship with him and um, uh, did my apprenticeship test there. And so my fundamental vocation is, is bookbinding, uh, just as you said. And it was it became very important uh, when I took up my... Uh, dissertation studies at the university because that was within the field of vocational didactics. And so I, I ended up doing the first part of the study, interviewing Wolfgang about his own vocational education in Germany and Stuttgart in the 50s and in Paris in the 60s. And the narratives or the stories that he told were so interesting from the point of view of being stories of how people were teaching. And so uh, to summarize what I've what my research has been about is really to to argue that if we document unusual stories or stories of unusually successful or interesting or enriching ways of educating, it can be specific things that you do in the classroom, ways of communicating with a student, it can be curricula that are constructed, uh, and so on. So these narratives can have a, a a lot of different forms, or you could also call them case studies if you wish. Uh, 
it's a way of documenting the professional or practical knowledge of teachers. And you hear that I'm talking about it from the point of view of a craftsperson. Uh, and that was easy for me to kind of think in that sense that a, a teacher possesses a lot of practical knowledge that is very seldom codified. Uh, if you understand what I mean, in, in the sense that it's tacit or silent in that it's experiential, but we rarely are asked to uh, articulate that knowledge in any um, systematic sense. So if I were to, um, to really summarize what I wanted to, to convey in my research is that we could, we could benefit from uh, a kind of renewed um, um, uh, search for um, um, practical knowledge or practical narratives in the same way that people were traveling around Europe in, in the 19th century collecting fairy tales from, from people. We could just go around collecting tales of interesting ways of teaching. And I'm going to come back to this later on in the, in the lecture in any case, but it, it, it might sound a little bit fluffy, but it actually isn't because there's so many things that are done by teachers and are in a sense invented by teachers that are never actually given uh, a written shape. So they're, tr they're transmitted orally, if at all, or they stay as an individual teacher's practical knowledge, but they're not giving to, given to the community. And so there's sometimes very little community development. And this isn't something that I invented or came, came to think about uh, on my own. One of the foremost scholars in, in the United States in the late 80s and, and 90s, Lee Schulman, remarked upon the same thing when it came to the teacher profession, that in comparison with, for example, artists or psychoanalysts, psychoanalysts or um, even, be even ballet or uh, chess, you have these uh, things codified in one way or another. Interesting or important uh, chess matches are written down. You have the choreography of the ballet written down. You have the art is actually remains in one way or another, but, but the art of teaching doesn't remain the same way that a poem or a sculpture or a piece of architecture does because it takes place in time in classroom. And after that, you might have some, some um, uh, elements remaining like tests and what have you, but what actually took place uh, disappears unless someone uh, constructs a narrative around it and tells someone else about it. Um, and um, in any case, that's only part, or that was part of my research. And the other part focused on how these narratives could be understood as a way of surfacing or articulating uh, processes of building. And for those of you who aren't German speaking or Swedish speaking and, and familiar with building as a com uh, concept, I will have to give a short explanation to begin with uh, what, it, what it means in order to um, then build this lecture around that. And so I'm, of course, now I'm speaking as if you had never heard the word. So everyone who is at least somewhat familiar with the concept, you can take a minute off. I was almost gonna say, maybe this is something that still, uh, uh, gives a, uh, a new perspective to it. Usually, in, especially in Sweden, building would be something uh, that most people connect to being just well-read or well-educated. And in German, building, in a sense, means both a specific uh, educational tradition and education in general. And it has roots already in, in ancient Greece in, in the Greek way of, um, <clears throat> of educating called paideia. The word itself uh, goes back to medieval times, to the mystic uh, uh, Maise Eckert, uh, and was originally an idea of how God made our soul into an image of himself if we opened ourselves to that process, build being uh, the German word for, for image. And if you wanted to translate it, you could basically call it uh, formation or growth uh, something like that. I'm going to share a PowerPoint, I must have got, and uh, move immediately to that slide. Um, and there are, from that point of view, a number of different categories of building that are usually mentioned. So people talk about someone who is intellectually educated or gebildet, or some, there's 
a category of aesthetic building. You can talk about moral building or practical or spiritual building. And I would say that part takes a lot of work to really get into, comparatively speaking, at least. But there's one way of approaching this area, which is very simple and does require a lot of, or does not require a lot of philosophical study, which is basically to just ask yourself, what do you remember from your life as especially meaningful, enriching, enlightening, or what have you? Uh, and when you answer those uh, uh, questions, that would be basically your most fundamental building experiences. And this means that you can talk about these educational processes without actually even using the concept of building if you want to, and still focus on what's really important here. Uh, the, the center of education in a sense that that which kind of um, builds up a biographical coherence and integrity. And it's interesting that uh, one of the most uh, uh, central scholars in didactics in Germany in the 20th century, Wolfgang Klafke, he wrote on this topic that <clears throat> it should be clear that the classical understanding of building means above all the awakening of self-determined moral responsibility, a readiness for moral action and the capacity for moral action. And then he mentions a number of uh, thinkers in, in the German language who were uh, central to the development of this tradition from the 17th century onward, Count Pestalozzi, Fichte, Fiegel, for instance, who he says showed complete agreement on this score and even interpretations of Herder, Goethe, Humboldt, or Froebel that described their concept of building as being one-sided, the aesthetic, or even aestheticizing, missed that mark. And so this is also something I will come back to towards the end, that this whole educational concept is strongly oriented towards moral development. And I think it's important to, to mention that in, uh, initially also because Waldorf education is, uh, at least from my point of view, strongly tied to this uh, educational tradition. And that in a sense, I would say one of the main or the main aim of Waldorf education is exactly this awakening of self-determined moral responsibility uh, in our students. And Another aspect, and this is where I'm going to get into the craft as, uh, area of the whole thing, is that um, there's, um, in my opinion at least, an unusual emphasis in Waldorf education on material and spiritual building. Uh, if, you, if one looks at the other categories, for instance, I would say that I, I, I've found a num any number of schools uh, or uh, pedagogical traditions which are very focused on intellectual building or aesthetic building in, in ways that sometimes are similar to how we do it in Waldorf schools, sometimes differ a bit, but where the, um, the general uh, idea, at least, or the general aim is fairly compatible. Uh, what I found very rarely, if at all, uh, are um, educational traditions where there's a intense focus on spiritual building, not, not in the sense of religious building, that is in the sense of deepening a specific religious form of thought, uh, the way a lot of uh, uh, Christian schools do, for instance. But I would say here, uh, at least from, from my understanding, the interesting thing about Waldorf schools is that we try to provide uh, our students with a kind of spiritual general education or building in the sense of developing an inward sensitivity towards those experiences that we have inside of ourselves, in our souls. Uh, in the way that we um, develop concepts for this, we develop or, or point to nuances in that. Uh, and also, and even more importantly, uh, developing an understanding towards the ex spiritual experiences of others, uh, which I would consider a form of moral building to be, uh, to be clear that. It's, it's important, I think, to both recognize and think about that uh, in that our students, hopefully at least, have a sensitivity to what it means for a person to have a deep spiritual experience or a deep religious connection. Uh, because it seems to me that uh, a school which doesn't provide the opportunity to develop that kind of sensitivity uh, risks leaving students with a, such a desensitized relationship towards the inner experience of a human being or the inner potential inner, inner experiences of a human being that we become limited in our interactions with others. 
And that I would say is also one of the general or common threads through the whole Bildung tradition is that the whole point is to allow us to develop deeper relationships with ourselves, with others, with nature, with culture. And those relationships are, are so um, manifold that uh, without an, uh, at least some emphasis on the spiritual side of things, it simply becomes more difficult to, uh, to empathize with other people, to relate to them, especially if they're not atheists themselves. I think that's an interesting element in Waldorf education because it's something that is an interest in wrestling, at least not from my point of view, it's not an interest in teaching the students a specific kind of spirituality, but rather to provide them with a sensitivity towards spirituality as such, if you understand what I mean. And one might think that material building is the polar opposite of this. Uh, that when we work with matter, with things that are uh, made of clay or wood or paper, that we're doing the complete opposite of working with something spiritual. Now, I think these two aspects actually are much closer to each other than one might initially think, and I'm going to get back to that as well towards the end. Uh, but I find that this is also something that's unusually emphasize, uh, emphasized in, in uh, Waldorf education particularly, is this choice of materials that we're not satisfied with providing students with practical uh, tasks uh, in materials that aren't um, thought through, that aren't worked through in the sense that you choose, you choose your wood carefully, you choose the clay, the wax, the pigments for the colors, all these things are, and I mean, this is obvious if you look at the architecture of many Waldorf schools, if, if you look at spent on how the walls are painted, how the rooms are decorated, those kind of things. The, this material aspect of education is unusually emphasized in, in Walder schools to the degree that I've been uh, able to, um, to compare with other schools. And uh, I'm sure there are exceptions, absolutely. And I would love to see those exceptions because it would be such an exciting thing to see how other people have taken up the, these uh, issues and work with them. But at least uh, that would be my kind of introduction to this. And if we then look at material and practical building a bit more uh, specifically, um, I would say that there are uh, a number of different ways of focusing on this. One I just mentioned, mentioned the building potential of matter itself. That is, uh, as I've wrote, written here, how can our perception of color become sensitized through the use of pigments? How can our perception of space become sensitized through architectural design? How can our sense of touch become sensitized through contact with a wide sampling of materials? If you understand what I mean, that the whole material environment that we're um, uh, part of is also something that sensitizes us or desensitizes us to various things. We can give our students an enormous uh, gift if we think about uh, the design or the uh, yeah the design of the their material environment and what they come into contact with literally speaking and how their senses are um, are stimulated it it's clear for instance that a person who is fairly unschooled within the um, uh, visual arts basically mostly painting uh, has, I think, this is something I'd love to follow up on. I, I, it's my bookbinding master who mentioned it to me, so he might be mistaken, but his, um, uh, his claim was that uh, a normal person can see about 5,000 nuances of color and actually differentiate between them. And a trained artist can go up to about 10 or 15,000. So it's clear from just that uh, simple, um, observation that our senses are in no way finished processes, rather that our senses can be infinitely uh, developed in different ways. And clearly, um, as, uh, as also our friend uh, Steiner remarked in, in uh, his, uh, uh, one of his early books, The Philosophy of Freedom, uh, it's not just through thinking that we have our, um, 
uh, that, we, that we develop our knowledge, but equally through uh, perception. We can be incredibly intelligent and knowledgeable intellectually, but if our perceptions are, are poor that, or impoverished, we have very little to think about. So <laughs> if you understand what I mean here, and so it's important to give care to what stimulates the senses of our students. And this, of course, is, is to a large degree an issue of material building. And it's also to a large degree an issue, not just of what we do actively educationally, that is what we do when we design uh, an educational content, but also uh, how the environment works passively educationally. That is the difference between preschool children uh, touching when they crawl around, touching a, a wooden floor that is oiled or a wooden floor that is lacquered. I'm getting specific here, but I think it's important to be, be specific enough to not to uh, illustrate what this means because a lacquered wood, wooden floor is fairly cold to the touch because lacquer is cold, whereas an oiled wooden floor is warm to the touch. So it makes a difference to the children when they touch the floor, what the floor has been treated with. Uh, just beyond any kind of practical issues regarding the difference between oiled and wooden, uh, oiled and lacquered wooden floors. Um, and you can go through that uh, in almost all areas of material uh, questions. It, it's, it's the same thing when using pigments. Most pencils and uh, pens made for schools are made with very cheap pigments. So the pigments don't really sensitize our eyes to to nuances of blue, yellow, and red, the way they could if people took care of ma uh, in making the crayons with the, with the, yeah, I guess more exclusive pigments. And that I'd, um, I'd say is also characteristic of at least a lot of the things that are made for Waldorf schools. For instance, the crayons from Stockmar are simply, um, how do you say, um, uh, um, impressive. Impressive in the way someone has thought about how to make uh, something material that is that has quality compared to what you normally encounter in these areas. And if you move from the material part to the practical part, I'd say <clears throat> we are talking then about the building potential of work or manual activity. And there are several different directions that this takes. Uh, and I'm sure there are more than these three that I'm gonna mention right now. I'd say there's a potential inherent in the craft tasks as such, that is in making something, whatever the case may be, which I'll get back to. And there's a potential in integrating craft elements in cognitively oriented education, which is what I'll get back to almost immediately. And then there's a potential in learning a craft vocation that is actual vocational education, which I've written about in a couple of articles for, for the uh, Rose Journal just recently. So I'm going to completely skip that part because that's almost a, a whole lecture in itself. And if, for anyone really interested, there's so much, especially in German written about, for instance, the Hibernia School or the uh, Walder School in Kassel or in Nuremberg where uh, these, um, these matters have been taken much further than in, in the conventional Walder curriculum. Um, but moving on to the first part, I'd say when, when you think about a craft task, it's important to consider, or important, it's educationally relevant to consider the significant volumes of potential knowledge related to, for instance, culture, history, chemistry, physics, and so on, that are inherent in these tasks. One such example uh, has nothing to do with Waldorf education at all, is from Michael Faraday, the well-known British physicist who uh, held an, uh, over the years celebrated lectures for youth on, on physics and chemistry. And one of his most famous lecture series uh, over Christmas was the chemical history of a candle, where he takes a, a candle as a starting point to discuss all manner of things related to chemistry, especially the um, what's called as Kretzlop in English, the, the way carbon uh, moves through uh, the uh, various states from uh, solid through 
uh, gaseous forms and then back into solidifying, ending up uh, discussing also uh, what's it called, the photosynthesis. Uh, and all of these things are, uh, are latent or potentially there in a physical candle. And by taking his point of departure in a candle or actually a number of candles, he starts discussing initially candles, different kinds of wax, different kinds of wicks, you know, the, the thing you light in the candle and so on uh, to really go into the physical aspect of it. And of course we could take and have taken that a step further at the Waldorf University College where we also make candles with the students to uh, give it even more of a substantiality so that in, in an um, uh, ideal world, you'd start with candle making in the lower grades. And then as you get to grade seven or eight, where this um, a natural science element is relevant, the students have a much firmer grasp or a per much more of a personal relationship with this object that they're then discussing and uh, uh, developing a whole science curriculum from. Similarly, uh, we had a, a little project a few years ago at the Waldorf University College where we did bronze casting and iron smithing with our class teachers in order to give them a sense and an experience of the difference between bronze and iron, especially then we made uh, um, arrow tips. So they cast a bronze arrow tip and they uh, um, wrought an iron arrow tip and I could thereby really get into an understanding of what's the difference between bronze and iron. And what do we mean when we talk about bronze and iron age civilization? I'd say most of the time that those concepts which are central to teaching of history are so abstract that few people actually understand what this means other than that at one point people used bronze and at another point they started using iron. And trying to understand why and what it meant requires a great deal of imagination and becomes much more um, grounded through this, the introduction of these practical elements. Uh, and I'm going to show you something um, uh, for this last part, uh, which uh, we do sometimes in, in, uh, in uh, teaching bookbinding at the Christopher School. Here I'm holding, let me see, first, this is a Western book a regular uh, cloth bound book. We make this in ninth grade. This is a characteristically Eastern book, a Japanese or Chinese binding. Uh, now, the interesting thing with these two books is that they're basically polar opposites. This is hardcover. Uh, the original uh, medieval books in, in Europe were bound with wooden covers really. and we've kept that tradition. So our covers are hard, whereas the Asian books are almost always soft. You can see from the formats, this is fairly elongated because you write from top to bottom rather than uh, horizontally. Uh, the writing utensils is a soft brush here. It's a hard feather pen here. I can go on for about five, five or six more minutes at least, listing all the different ways that these two books are uh, polar opposites in the way that they've developed. And there's, a, there's an expression of culture in that, which is hard to really illustrate or capture uh, as succinctly uh, through other means than this, that, than this illustrates. And so you can combine um, to a large degree, I would say, to a much larger degree than we actually do today. You can combine, um, Oops. Um, you can combine um, the different tasks that you do in, in the craft curriculum with these kind of um, contents that really illustrate or open uh, fields uh, of understanding for the students in, in all manner of different uh, uh, ways. And I've, as I've written here at the uh, towards the end of this slide, I'd say there remains a need here to systematically research and document what individual schools have achieved as pedagogical innovations in this area, because I think there's, there's a lot being done that simply remains within one school because there's a couple of teachers who had that 
that kind of idea and develop something. Uh, and I'd say there's a there's potentially here a significant source of pedagogical development within Waldorf education, where we have some of these things already developed, uh, but we could go far, far, uh, much further uh, than what we have until now. And it's unfortunate that for the most part, craftspeople have an understanding of their particular crafts and the particular tasks within their crafts, but they lack an understanding of the potential knowledge that could be expanded from those uh, tasks uh, towards culture, history, etc. And on the other hand, people who are tra academically trained uh, and teach history or teach chemistry rarely are taught uh, uh, or given access to the various craft tasks that would be uh, potentially enriching for what they do. So you have these two um, um, vocational fields that are just not integrated, which is, I'd say, um, uh, an effect of 2000 years of looking down on craftspeople as being basically uh, lesser than people who are academically trained. Uh, and so you have a huge division uh, that is socially um, uh, disruptive, I would say, to our to until today. Um, now, there's also, of course, a craft curriculum as such. Uh, and here I'm looking basically at the standard curriculum, as I've called it, because it's important, I think, to note that although there's a, a standard curriculum for Steiner or Waldorf schools that I'd say most schools adhere to more or less, there are also today at least uh, a fair number of different curriculum innovations. Uh, some of them I mentioned, like the Bernier School, which have, that, where they've integrated vocational education into upper secondary school. There's a significant deviation from the standard curriculum. And there's just a bunch of other diff, uh, schools that are, have grown from the same kind of tree of Waldorf educational uh, theory but have taken the curriculum in various way, uh, various directions, especially uh, in, um, in upper secondary school and to some degree in lower secondary school. I'm not as familiar with the uh, major deviations in grades one through six, although I'm sure they exist and I just haven't heard of them. Um, now, I'd say the interesting thing, if you look at what, what is usually done um, in, in a Steiner school, I'd say that when a student uh, um, takes part in the craft curriculum uh, from grades one through 12, they basically uh, move through most milestones in the material or practical building process of humanity from stone, the Stone Age until the late Middle Ages, more or less. Uh, it's an interesting uh, question to ask oneself why we stop in the late Middle Ages, which is also the question that the Urbania School asked in a critical sense, saying that it makes no sense to, to make a halt there and not provide the students with uh, the further path into modern, modernity and industrialization. In a sense, you almost end up with a kind of quaint idea uh, similar to uh, what William Morris and uh, the people around him in Britain had of what crafts are, rather than uh, perhaps building more on what was developed parallel to, to the Waldorf School in, in the Bauhaus tradition, for instance. But that's, that's a, a story for another day. So uh, for example, if you look at the textile curriculum, ideally speaking, you would clothe yourself from head to foot. Uh, for, uh, a few Walder schools have an actual shoemaker. The Walder school in Essen at least was an exception to this, where they actually had a full, uh, fully equipped shoemaking workshop and made beautiful dress shoes. Uh, and so you, you usually crochet or you knit your own hat, you make your mittens, you make uh, a shirt or, and some trousers. And there's a, I think it's a beautiful idea to, to kind of think that a, a person when they leave school, at least once in their life, they've made every item of clothing that is basic to, to have it being clothed. Uh, and then of course you engage in weaving, spinning, other areas uh, connected to textile work. There are, uh, some basic wooden tools that you make, for instance, a spoon and or a buttering knife, you make some bowls, you have some basic metal work. So you work in the most uh, uh, common metals, copper, tin and iron. Uh, and hopefully you make a book. 
Uh, you make some simple furnishing, for instance, a stool, a shelf, or a cabinet, or uh, several of those. There's some basket weaving involved, some gardening, clay work, of course, including on the turntable, and sometimes there are some brick making and laying. This isn't a, a completely solidified element of the curriculum, but rather it's a kind of semi-floating floating thing where some parts are uh, more traditional and other parts are less. For instance, this book that I showed you uh, is, I think, almost unique to the Christopher School where I work. Most Walder schools do not have book binding in the ninth grade the way we do, but rather uh, save that for 11th grade and 12th grade and or 12th grade. Um, so there are also, I'd say a lot of differences here from school to school, I'm sure. And some of the schools I visited had a very strong uh, sculptural curriculum and other schools, especially for instance, I I'd say in Sweden, the sculptural curriculum isn't as well developed as in some schools I visited in Germany. And that's the last part point here. It's not just that you make a bunch of craft objects, it's also within this uh, curriculum, a sculptural element that is partly separate. So it includes tasks where you basically sculpt with felt or wax or clay, and you make uh, in the um, upper secondary school, it's common that you make a sculpture of a head, for instance, and relief sculptures and things like that. And it's partly integrated into the uh, craft tasks in the sense of you, you're sculpting or forming bowls and vases. That, that kind of work is also uh, conducive to developing a sculptural touch. Um, I know schools where uh, they include instrument building. Sometimes uh, uh, a very skilled craft, uh, woodworking teacher might have built uh, violins with their students or flutes. Um, there's so much that could be done within this uh, curriculum that contains formidable, formidable aspects of uh, uh, or potentials for, for building processes to to emerge in, in students. Uh, so what I'm mentioning here is just basically, uh, what would you call it? The skeleton uh, of, of the curriculum. And uh, it's a matter for our uh, educational pedagogical imagination to think of other ways of um, developing this further. Um, having said that, I can move on to the last, I'd say, major element that I, I considered in, in giving this brief overview uh, is, is about crafts and human growth and development, where I'd say that an important aspect of why we have crafts and what the crafts achieve in education is that they support the development of sensor motor skills, uh, that is just basically the development of uh, uh, of your senses and your capacity to, especially fine motor skills, to, to become uh, skilled with your, with your hands. And this in turn has been shown to significantly impact positively the cognitive development of children, but only in a very general sense as far as I know. That is, I know of no research connected specifically to one craft or another, showing that, for instance, knitting develops this kind of cognitive uh, capacities and bookbinding develops this and so on and so forth. What I know of in, in research-wise is that there's some serious research that shows that just basically becoming more skilled with your hands has a very positive impact on the cognitive development of children, generally speaking. So it would be wonderful if one could have more specific research on what actually takes place when you do the different kinds of uh, craft tasks that we engage with the students with in. Um, they also support something I would call the integration of mental representations and making activities. And this is difficult. I don't really know how to uh, uh, articulate it, but I'm going to show you something. This is luckily, I can illustrate this with something from my own life, which is kind of embarrassing, especially showing this on an international stage, but uh, it, it'll give you all a chance to uh, at least uh, chuckle merrily. And so you can see here, uh, to the right of me at least, I have what is a regular buttering knife in Sweden. And to the left is my replica of the buttering knife that I did or made in fifth grade, I believe. 
And it doesn't take much uh, to see that there's a significant difference here in the shapes of them. And I remember when I made that buttering knife in, in fifth grade or sixth grade or whatever, whenever it was, that I, I looked at it when I was finished and I had this vague, discomfort, uncomfortable feeling that something was off with it, but I couldn't quite place it. And I went home and I showed it to my parents and they were like, I, I think they tried to look happy about it. They, they obviously saw that it, it looked like nothing like, like an actual buttering knife. And it was, it lay there in our um, kitchen drawer for, I don't know, a year or two or, or three. And for the life of me, I could not see the difference between these two in the sense that I saw it. Because I remember the day when I looked into that drawer and I might have been in seventh or eighth grade at that point. And I saw the knife for the first time and saw what it was that was wrong or different. So it, it's weird. I, I literally could not see it, which is, I, I assume, close to, uh, um, what would you say, um, not a disability, but uh, something that would have severely hampered elements of my capacity to interact with the world. Of, you wouldn't have noticed it. I was, of course, perfectly capable of using a regular butter, buttering knife, but there was something in my capacity to translate a mental representation into a, a form with my hands, which, which didn't quite uh, work. And where I wasn't able to see um, my environment or my surroundings, it, in the way you'd expect someone to see it. I, as you see, I'm trying to find the words to express what is that, what, what actually went on inside of myself or must have gone on inside of me at, at that time when I, was, uh, when I was young. And I'm pretty sure because I had a lot of extra crafts in, in, in the Christopher School. And when I say a lot, I really mean it. I had so much extra book binding and so much extra metal work. And I think that probably, although it's impossible for me to say with any certainty, but I think it probably helped me a lot in developing a, um, um, a connection between my mental representations and uh, my uh, perceptions or my capacity to see and then to translate what I saw, uh, see form and to translate that into a representation that actually matched the form that I saw or see. And so in this sense, I think a lot of us that work as craft teachers, we over and over again, we're confronted with students where we, where we notice that this student is way, uh, is, is simply does things in a way that demonstrates that there's something inside of that person going on that wouldn't be visible entirely unless you could see it through this object that you're working with. I've had, at least I remember one student who, it wasn't just that he had difficulty with differentiating between left and right, which a lot of people have, but the way he was binding his book, which is normally book binding goes like this. You go from, from right, right to left, and then you go one step up, you go back left to right, and then you go one step up back from right to left. He went around and any which way. I, it was such a, a weird thing that happened. and. And I talked to his teacher and said, there's, there's something in his sense of direction that isn't just um, slightly impaired, but where right and left and up and down and forward and backward are, are hardly differentiated from, for him. And where I, I was, I hope that we would have got, uh, given him much more of that kind of practice in order to, um, to finally develop a, a sense of those uh, those elements. Um, another uh, area, which I think in a, uh, probably is most significant in many ways, is that a well thought out craft task is, as far as I've been able to uh, ascertain, probably the single most effective way to increase a young person's self esteem and sense of coherence. Um, because, and that's something that I've um, uh, had the, uh, what do you say? not perhaps pleasure is the wrong word here, but uh, the privilege is the word I'm looking for uh, of working with uh, uh, fairly often, especially uh, in previous years with students who for one reason or another uh, lost their self-esteem, had 
all kinds of difficulties, might have very difficult home situations, um, might have learning disabilities or, or any other number of things. And most problems that a young person encounters also involve a loss of self-esteem and sense of, of self, together with whatever might have happened uh, apart from that. And when it was really severe, and I remember a few of them where their, their low self-esteem, it was so low that not even a regular kind of uh, craft task sufficed. And uh, definitely not that you as an adult said, yeah, well, you know, you're really, you're skilled or something like that. The only thing that helped was making something together with them that was so beautiful that they simply could not um, uh, disregard it. And for instance, I made this book together with a, uh, a girl in ninth grade who had um, who came to, to the book bindery actually ju just, uh, I don't know, might have been five or six days after she had tried to take her own life. And um, she sat there and I was talking to another student and I explained to him something we were doing and how important it was. And she asked some questions and I said, yeah, well, it's hard for me to really talk to you about it, but I'd be happy to make the same thing with you. And so we spent the better part of, I think, uh, a year making this book together. And you could literally see her sense of self grow uh, as this progressed. And I talked to her many years at, later um, when she had uh, graduated school. And she said that it was the first time in, in years where she felt that she was actually capable of doing something that turned out well. And the important thing with craft objects is that they're so, it was obvious, of course, they're so uh, tangible. You, you can see what you're making in a way that you can't when you work with symbols or texts or, or things like that. And so it's, they afford a teacher the uh, opportunity to really provide a student with a sense of uh, achievement, which shouldn't, which uh, is um, sometimes w really works magic, almost in the literal sense of the word, or perhaps even more so than any kind of magic uh, we normally conceive of when we talk about it. So I think that's also an important part of working with the crafts uh, in school. Um, and I think it largely depends on the individual schools, how much these things are developed. For instance, at the Christopher School, it's also one thing that I really appreciate about that school is that there's um, something called supportive crafts uh, that has been in place there for, I don't know, 40 years at least, where students can come to the workshops between 10 and 12 in the day and, um, and just spend two hours in, in the workshop every day for a period of five, six weeks, and mostly uh, for therapeutic reasons. Not therapy then in the, in the clinical sense of the word, but therapeutic in, the, in this sense of increasing their sense of coherence. And uh, the narratives from those, um, those students are sometimes remarkable in what they've been able to develop through that. And uh, I know a lot of other world of schools where they have no such practice and where sometimes uh, a student might spend more time in one of the workshops as a uh, special, uh, 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 what do you say, mas nam, uh, um, special action that is taken together with that student, but where it's not really something that is put into uh, any kind of systematic uh, form. So in, as you can see, all of these things that I'm mentioning are on the one hand, potentially there in the water schools, and then on the other hand, to a differing degree, actualized in, in individual schools. Now, I'm nearing the end. So I have two, um, <clears throat> um, two final um, uh, points to make that are more uh, oriented towards the future development of uh, the craft curriculum. Um, and as you see, I, I wrote as a header here, practical building and moral building, because I think one issue we have with schools, not just Walder schools, but schools in general today, is that they're mostly cloister-like uh, in that students spend the better part of their days in a building uh, 
focusing very much on their own personal development. And I would say that that might be adequate uh, in, uh, in primary school and secondary school, but as you reach upper sec uh, the secondary level and you reach the upper secondary level, I think it becomes more and more anachronistic because students or, or young people from the age of 14 or so uh, are limited in the moral building affordances provided to them from uh, that kind of organization. At the same time as people normally, I would say, wish more than anything to become part of the world and to make a difference for other people. It's, a, a, it's in a sense odd when a person is 14 and 15 and ha, does, hasn't developed a kind of idealism uh, geared towards actually making a difference in the world. And schools rarely afford them the opportunity to feel that they can. Uh, and so moral development becomes mostly cognitive for them. Uh, whereas in effect or in practice, moral development is largely effective uh, and dispositional. That is moral development requires moral action to, to be achieved. So even Aristotle noted this two th more than 2000 years ago that no one becomes brave by reading a bunch of books about bravery, but you, beco you become brave by actually doing brave actions. And you become generous, not by reading a book about generosity, but be, by being generous. So the only real way of achieving uh, or overcoming uh, a, recogni a recognized uh, what's uh, stinginess, I think is the opposite of generosity in English, right? Uh, is by being more generous in one way or another. So if you know that you, you have a difficulty there, you just have to practice generosity more. Uh, and so the issue is really where does school or where does our education provide students with this opportunity? Where does it afford them the opportunity to engage in moral development in this sense? And I'd say that practical work harbors a potential here of opening the school outwards into society and engaging students in actual developmental work, which isn't a theory really, but as I wrote in one of my articles, based on uh, some, um, on, on the, um, on a case study I did with uh, Wilfried Kessler in, uh, at the Water School in Ulm, or one of the Water Schools in Ulm in, in, uh, in Southern Germany, where he had developed a full project, or he, he had basically um, recognized this precise issue uh, as he was asked to be a class sponsor for an eighth grade uh, at that school, which was um, known to be uh, completely out of line. They were so difficult to, to have anything to do with it, almost, or no one really wanted to, uh, to take on that sponsorship. And he said that, fine, I'll do it if you allow me to uh, engage them the way I see fit. And there were some Romanian teachers there who knew a, uh, an anthroposophical uh, uh, doctor in Romania. And they ended up the students and then uh, all Num uh, not any other number of other students in the school and over, uh, yeah, up until today, I think, uh, building a clinic for him in Romania. And that's, a, that's where I think craft work intersects, intersects with the affordance of moral development. And where even though I think the craft tasks that we provide our students in, in upper secondary school are brilliant in the way they're thought through, there's still craft tasks that to, to a large degree end up in our own homes as gifts to our uh, loved ones and things like that. They're rarely tasks that bring us outside of uh, the school environment. And I think that's a matter for Waldorf education in the future to really think about is where do we provide, provide students when they turn 15 and 16 and, and, and onwards with ways of engaging with the world. And not just engaging with the world by talking to people and by communication, but in actual action, which is something completely different to some degree at least. The other thing I found, or I wanted to finish this whole thing with, is to return to this um, issue of the relationship between practical and spiritual building. And I remember when I was um, doing my bookbinding uh, apprenticeship, Wolfgang used to tell me a story about a Roman cardinal named Cusanus, 
who some of you might uh, be familiar with. He lived in the uh, 14th century, I believe. And uh, he wrote a treatise called in Latin, Idiota de Mente, which would translate as the layman on the spirit or mind. Uh, the layman being the idiot because he's not uh, a priest and therefore can't read. Uh, and in the uh, orally transmitted version that Wolfgang told me, uh, which is in, in some respects the almost opposite of what, uh, what the written version is when I finally found it. And you can find this much more uh, discussed, uh, further discussed in my licentiate thesis, which I forgot to put in the references, which is the next slide. Uh, the, um, the oral version is that uh, Cusanus visits Rome and a Roman bishop, uh, uh, that is his good friend, tells him that he has met the most amazing philosopher and he really wants uh, Cusanus to meet him. And he takes Cassanus un, uh, under his arm and he brings him home. And they look all around the uh, bishop's house and can't find this philosopher anywhere. anywhere. And it becomes, starts to become a bit embarrassing for the bishop until finally they find this uh, uh, philosopher in, in the um, stairway leading down to the cellar. And there in the stairway, he's sitting uh, carving a, 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 a wooden spoon. And the bishop, who's by now really embarrassed, uh, says something in line with, uh, how can you, being such a uh, profound thinker, engage in such um, uh, mean work as making a wooden spoon? That you could leave to any, uh, any farmer or uh, servant. Uh, and the, uh, the layman re replies in German, Ich arbeite der ganzen Erde, which is kind of difficult to translate because Löffelheit, which works as a word in German, is would be literally speaking spoonness. So what he what he says is, I'm working formatively on the whole spoonness of the earth. And I think that more than almost anything has been uh, something I, I've borne in mind. Uh, as I teach crafts uh, at the Christopher School or at the teacher education, uh, where a world of teacher education where I work, is that when we do something with our hands, and when we make a spoon or whatever the bookness of the earth might be, we engage with something that could potentially, if we take up that affordance, uh, expand to, to include work on the whole cosmos. And so, there's actually uh, a depth of spirituality inherent in these practical craft tasks if you uh, engage in that and explore it that I find um, uh, to be quite literally almost breathtaking. And it's the same with a, um, a fragment I came across in, in a collection of fragments by Novalis called Blut Blutenstaub, where he wrote, uh, that we are on a mission, we are called to the building of the earth. And that, at that point, I had to kind of uh, build this lecture around building because otherwise it would be almost impossible to understand why this quote by Novalis is so interesting in that he's saying that not only are we called in towards our self formation, our development of our own moral responsibility uh, and our relationship towards others as human beings, but we're called to the formation and the growth of the whole earth. And as far as I can see, that would include the whole cosmos. And this is something we do uh, when we work with matter, I would say. And that's a tradition much older than uh, Waldorf education and anthroposophy that Waldorf education in a sense has inherited or that has found its way into our Waldorf schools and that I think it's important to be aware of and to consider uh, how we can nurture and, and recognize. And I see that it's eight o'clock. And so I think I did a pretty good job uh, finishing this lecture in one hour sharp. And so we have uh, 30 minutes for uh, a possible discussion or uh, 
whatever the case may be. Uh, thank you very much for your um, uh, uh, uppmärksamhet. Jesus, I forget the simplest English words sometimes when I'm not used to speaking English for uh, attention. For your attention. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Rui. <laughs> okay. Can you shut down the, the PowerPoint? Yes, I'd be happy to. So thank you so much, Rui. That was very much inspiring. And I got the feeling that there are sentences like gold coins in your lecture. That was really, I, so it was, I will listen to that again with the video. So it was, was just wonderful to see that perspective you gave and how you deal with the craft. So working with small things, but have the cosmic dimension. And yeah, that was very nice. Thank you so much. I think there might be a couple of questions or remarks from other people. So we are open for discussion now. Let's see if there's something coming in. Many thank yous coming to you. <laughs> so there's a question from Da Silva. Um, I'm wondering how I can integrate crafts in my school subject English. Any idea? Hmm. Good question. Uh, <clears throat> language, of course, in a sense, perhaps is almost, the, it, it, at least to my prejudiced mind, I'm saying now, <laughs> uh, is a bit, uh, is probably the furthest removed uh, from... Uh, uh, from craft work, De uh, of course, it depends on what also uh, uh, what grades we're talking about. I'd say something that has been very inspiring for, to me uh, to read about is the uh, in German it's called the Bewegliche Klassenzimmer. Uh, in English, I'm not sure there's an established concept for it yet, but where you work much more with. Uh, uh, with uh, furnishing the classroom environments, especially in grades one through three, in such a way that they become very uh, uh, mobile. So you can use uh, the furnishings to, uh, for, to engage in play activity. You build your lessons much more around rhythms and activities than you would in a more traditional sense. Um, and there's a couple of books, uh, or at least one, fairly extensive writing on, on that subject in German uh, that I came across a couple of years ago. Uh, and I think that's a good starting point when, uh, when we're talking about the lower grades, where I think it's not so much about crafts particularly, but really about activating the body as such that is becoming active in your movement. Uh, because in a sense, crafts only specialize those movements in different areas. Whereas I think, uh, a large part of what I've been talking about is also just generally the issue of how to become uh, more active, how, our, our, how we engage with our sense of balance, our sense of movement, our sense of touch and so on. And that can be done through play activities, through uh, rhythmic um, activities. And then of course you have the whole um, uh, uh, treasure trove of different verses and, and rhymes and, and so, so on that you can work with in, in language. Um, if you're um, moving upwards in grades, I think the issue becomes probably a very practical one to begin with. How much time can I devote towards this uh, from the few lessons that I actually have? Uh, and I think that's one of the reasons why I mentioned that this is an area for further development in, in Waldorf education because you immediately run into an issue of, okay, if we find a craft task that has this potential, how can we work with it in such a way that it doesn't detract from the time needed to learn the theoretical elements that you need to learn, but at the same time, it, it, but rather that it supports this. And uh, I think one needs to take uh, a long look then at how our uh, school days are structured and the curriculum that they embody to see what, what's actually possible. Um, that's of course a very abstract thing to, to answer, but that's basically because I don't know of any concrete example of how someone's worked with it. 
uh, that's a, an issue for one's imagination. I think um, uh, I would assume um, one way of thinking about it could be, uh, say that I teach German in Sweden and I have some particular elements of my, uh, uh, what's it called, uh, my pensum, the, the things I have to teach and say, I'm just making things up now, grade seven. And I can see that at one point we're talking about something uh, that would allow us to read about uh, maybe craftspeople, maybe there's some important texts, particularly in German, about craftsmanship in one area or another. And I could combine the reading of that text with uh, my uh, fellow craft teacher making something that is related within that text. That would be a way of kind of beginning such a thing. Um, yeah, as you see, I'm just messing around here, <laughs> to be honest. Don't worry, don't worry. Um, <laughs> we take those questions all as an inspiration to think yeah. further. Yeah. Um, so there's another question by Nicola. Mm -hmm. um, and the question is, um, if, if you think that the process of crafting is more important than the result, or are they um, of equal importance? I think this is a very in interesting didactical question. It, I, as a craft teacher in particular, have to have the awareness that sometimes it's the result that's important. And I need to uh, make that the focus. Sometimes the process needs to be entirely the focus and it's better if we don't even achieve a result because it will, it will detract from the process. And then other times, perhaps most times, it's kind of a balance between process and result. For instance, here in bookbinding, uh, the cool thing, or one of the cool things about these books is that we have to help them with the covers. It's just impossible for a student in ninth grade to have enough time to develop the skill to make the covers themselves. And so everyone makes what pretty much looks like a perfect book. So even if they're very unskilled in, in bookbinding, the results become very um, impressive to them. And that's uh, particular to, to bookbinding as a craft, at, the, at least the way we can teach it, and which is great. So sometimes, uh, and, and for some students, that's very important. In other crafts, especially with some craft tasks, the process becomes much more central because the results might be completely meaningless or at least very significantly from student to student. Um, and um, I'd say if you have a class, it's the good thing is that you work through different craft tasks and some students will be uh, uh, especially um, tilltalad is um, especially, um, what's that? Uh, spoken to is not really a good uh, expression in English, but they'll, they'll feel especially connected to or developed through uh, a task which uh, puts an uh, emphasis on the results and other students will be much more developed through tasks which are uh, process oriented. Uh, as, but then you can get into uh, areas where, you have, for instance, you might have a student who's extremely, um, what do you call it? Uh, um, Pedantic is not an English word, is it? Pedantic is, I think, the German word. A student Pedantic who, is English as well. It is, yeah. yeah. Who's, who has difficulties disengaging with something that isn't absolutely perfect. And those students in particular, you can really work with and try to help them to overcome that kind of uh, need to make everything perfect by making things s swiftly and badly and, and just making them in order to get into the process. And you can have the, you can find the opposite. Of course, we have students who are happily engaged in processes, don't give a crap about the uh, results. And where, where, you, where you can find that they have a difficulty actually engaging without making the result um, good enough so that it's useful. And there you can place much more of an emphasis on the results to help them to overcome that kind of I would really call it sloppiness is perhaps not a really good word for it, but uh, difficulty with uh, being care, uh, taking care with what you're doing. So that's my long answer to, to that question. 
Yeah, you should uh, maybe answer a bit more shortly because Sorry. <laughs> a couple of more. No, no, it's yeah. it's wonderful to listen, but there are so many questions uh, yeah. coming yeah. in. So and maybe it would be interesting to touch them. There's one from I I from from the Philippines. By the way, thank you for being with us. With us, um, it should be your night time right now. Mm. Um, so it's the question, is cooking considered a craft? We are from the Philippines, so having access to these book binding materials or iron or bronze are challenging. Mm, sure, I definitely put cooking in, in the general uh, uh, topic of be being a craft. Yeah, you can do beautiful things with cooking, developing the senses, especially of, of smell and taste, of course. Okay, so Becky Rutherford has a question. Maybe you can put it yourself. It's a question of ecology nowadays and throwaway culture. Yeah, could you speak a bit more about <clears throat> how crafts, the development of the, the creating of a pen, for example, or the creation of a book, how, how does that affect the adolescent in a way to kind of stand in, in front of this unbelievable abundance of things. Mm. I used the example of a pen, for example, uh, and how they're just throw away, you use them once, and yet we help the student to make something that would last their lifetime. And could you speak a bit about how that affects their moral connection to popular culture? Right, well, I think, and I'm speaking now from my experience more than anything else. I don't know. I'm sure there are differences between schools here, but I'd say there's a tacit or implicit idea that focusing so much on the on the quality of materials when when students are young gives them develops an aesthetic sense in them that hopefully makes it uncomfortable for them to deal with things that are cheap and that aren't really meant to to last. Of course. I highly doubt that this is the case, or I know for a fact that this does not happen for all students all the time. Uh, and I think one interesting and important aspect, issue for us in, in Waldorf schools is that these matters of, of implicit or tacit moral development need to become explicit uh, when they reach adolescence. I think the same holds for aesthetic education. We think that by giving them this in, immense enrichment of imagination, of their artistic imagination, it will also enrich their moral imagination. But the jump from art to moral imagination is not automatic. And so I think it's a big question for us generally, how do we speak to them and how do we engage them in such a way in adolescence and upwards that they are afforded this uh, uh, leap from the aesthetic element to the moral element in a more conscious matter, uh, a manner. And I think, or at least for as far as I'm concerned, I know of comparatively few um, uh, practical examples of how this has been done thus far. And as, as I said, I'm sure there are a number of practical examples. As I mentioned, I think Wilfried Kessler and his project in Romania is such an example. But what I would uh, genuinely really hope for is that we would have a collection of such examples in another few years or so, where we really talk about how Waldorf education uh, deals with this move from the uh, artistic imagination to the moral imagination, where I think that your question is kind of a sub-question to that, in that it's, it's an aesthetic experience when we confront a material, and it has to become a moral experience as well, or it, it's important that it does. Mm. Thank, Thank you. you. There has been a um, hand raised by Johannes. Welcome, Johannes. Do you want to speak? <clears throat> okay, yes. Thank you very much. And thank you, Rui, for your inspiring talk. I would like to come back to uh, the first question addressing um, how English lessons can be combined with crafts. And uh, on the one hand, I think what you have race is very um, convincing and interesting, especially for wildlife education. But I would like to suggest not to exaggerate this principle over <laughs> all topics. So I would, um, I, I would think that language is a material on its own. 
and can be crafted by mental hands. So um, perhaps this is another field which could not be adequately uh, dealt with in material crafts. So what would you say about this? Quite possible. I would say that this, uh, to be honest, I, I would say this is entirely a practical question. If we can imagine a way of dealing with language that is adequate, that is, that is adequate to the language, uh, and at the same time working with something practical in the sense of material, manual, then fine, wonderful. Uh, and we can defend it didactically, of course. It, it, that would be so awesome to see what that would be. Uh, but you might have, uh, it might just be that no one is ever able to figure out a way of doing that. And in that case, you're completely right because uh, then, then it's obviously impossible uh, uh, or uh, hardly possible at least. One thing that I think you point to that is very important here is that it, it's sometimes we become a bit, um, how do you say it, uh, a bit too superficial in how we think about these uh, integrations of, of aesthetic and practical subjects and other subjects. So I've heard music teachers, for instance, say, yeah, but you know, when you, when you play music, you do math. And of course, on a very general level, you do math. The issue is, do you do the particular kind of math that is relevant for the students to learn in, in that particular unit or uh, at that particular age? And if you don't, it makes no sense to combine music with math in, the, in that superficial way. So you really have to think about what is the theoretical content or the intellectual cognitive content that the student has to learn? And is there a way of finding uh, of enriching that through aesthetic or practical subjects that can be defended from a didactical point of view, then I think it's, it's incredibly in interesting to look at it. But it has to be more than just a superficial, let's make something because we know it's good and everyone's happy when you make things. Sometimes you just can't figure out what that would be and then you'd, there's no reason to be unhappy about it because as you say, language is also material in itself. And there's, there's no, um, inherently nothing inherently wrong with working with language just as language definitely not okay so graham something um now john burnett something saying to that the it's muted uh, you have to put on your microphone i i think this question about um integrating craft into language um in a way, one can trace it back to the remark that was made earlier in the talk about 2,000 years of looking down on craftspeople. Because I think we have, a, um, we have inherited from the past a cultural divide which has privileged, certainly since the sort of 15th century, those who are able to manage the uh, abstraction of, of intellectual thinking and also um, mastery of la language. And that's led, that has led to a cultural division for many teachers, and I think in, in, in many situations where if you're good at maths and you're good at language and you're good at academic subjects, um, that leads to a career pathway which is going to be very different than if you choose um, a vocation which is in the craft. What I value from this talk is that you have, um, if you like, validated and, and given a very lively picture of the potential of ward of education, the, if you like, ward of culture that we have internationally. But my question, I think, is coming back to the to the research. How much research has been done that makes this um, a dialogue that can 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 work in the future at, in in terms of educational policy and so forth? And how much research needs to be done? Otherwise, we're looking at a ward of culture, which is relatively closed within itself, which is rich and huge potential. Mm. But we are in a culture which we, we have inherited a culture which has, I would say, this, this cultural division between mm. those who can manage the abstract, master the abstract aspects of education, and those um, who, as you said, for 2000 years, they've been looked down on. I, I'd be very interested in your comments Mm, mm. on the research potential mm. and if you yeah. like the cultural shift which i think is brought in i think covid brings this in a lot because so, so many people have lived in this sort of abstract head world which we're in at the moment you know of the, of the screen 
And within that, the potential for what you're talking about is hugely important as a cultural shift. But how far are we there? I'd like to know how how far we how far are we there in the world? Not just a Waldorf, mm. but to what contribution right. can we as Waldorf teachers make, not only within our own culture, but in our contribution to the wider wider society? Yeah, thank you. Um, so basically, uh, that's a whole another lecture, I would say. But if I'm going to give the shortest answer, I'd say my uh, my dissertation and the licentiate thesis that I wrote a couple of years before that uh, summarizes a lot of that research. So you can find a lot of uh, answers to those questions within those uh, those texts. I haven't written them written them as research on Waldorf education at all. The research on vocational bildung, but most of what is written there is highly relevant to towards this kind of uh, uh, inquiry. And then there's definitely uh, some research done around the Hibernia school. Most of that uh, and other practical vocational uh, initiatives within Waldorf uh, schools and uh, particularly in Germany, most of that is in German. Uh, there's one UNESCO study from the Hibania School from 1979, which was translated into English. You can download it today from the UNESCO homepage as a PDF. Yeah. Uh, of course, that's old as hell, but it's still very relevant to a large degree. Um, I think those are some of the best starting points. There's also, oh yeah, and in English, there's one absolutely amazing uh book by uh, Lewis Hetland and a couple of colleagues by, of hers called Studio Thinking, published, I think, for the first time in 2007 and in a second edition in 2012, where they've um, made a, a very a brilliant inquiry into what you learn in the studio arts. Mm -hmm. uh, studio Thinking, I can just warmly recommend. Uh, I, it's required reading for all the craft teachers that we have uh, at the a subject teacher program at the Waldorf University College. Um, again, has nothing to do with Waldorf education, but is so relevant to how we think about these things. And they have a scathing argument, which I love, about uh, the, uh, the problems and issues with arguing for craft education as something that would advance uh, academic studies and say that craft education you do because you'd learn something from crafts that are unique. And, and that's why, why it's important, not because you become better at math, which mm -hmm. I think is great. Um, I'm unsure if anyone has done the job yet of really going through all the different articles that exist regarding sensor motor development and all those things, because there's, there's a bunch of uh, research that has been done, but it's scattered. I know Bernhard Schmalenbach wrote uh, uh, his dissertation in 29 or something like that on, on the hand. And he did, at least up until then, he, he summarized a lot of that research, uh, which is of course, again, in German, but that- Yeah, that, uh, but there, uh, there is also the wonderful book by Wilson about the hand, you know? Oh yeah, 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 yeah of course. Frank R. Wilson mm -hmm. wrote his book about the hand, that's from 1998. But that's uh, the problem with Wilson's book is it's not uh, have, doesn't have any educational uh, perspective. No, it's just philosophy. So you really have to um, extrapolate from it. So there's definitely some work to be done, I think. Um, yeah. Thank you. A question um, by um, by Kalimba. Maybe you can can tell yourself, Kalimba. Are you in? Um, so I'm just going to read it for you and I still have my video off. Um, that was coming back from the beginning of the lecture when you linked the um, practical work and the craft lessons to spirituality. So my question was, if you could explain a little further how you wake up the spirituality awareness within craft lessons in small classes. In the same way, maybe you help teenagers to go on uh, in making a difference in the world by actions, by making things. Um, so if I understand you correctly, how, if, and to what degree I introduce uh, a spiritual perspective into the craft work uh, when students are young? 
Yes, that's it. Mm. Uh, to be honest with you, since I teach bookbinding, I don't really teach uh, students that are younger than 14 or 15, other than uh, ex in ex exceptional cases. So I haven't really thought, thought about it. Um, also, yeah, I would have to think a lot about how to uh, bring such a perspective into it in a way that doesn't conceptualize too much, but rather works uh, more on an emotional and, uh, and artistic level. So perhaps I would think more about what we make and how we make it. Uh, perhaps if I was um, uh, doing, which, which is fairly common, I think, when you, uh, when you color with um, thread, no, next finding. Um, when you work with, uh, um, Jesus, um, uh, coloring the threads that they're going to knit with and use, using uh, colors from, from bark and leaves and stuff like that. Are, are you familiar with what I'm talking about? Dying, here? yes, dying. Yeah, dying, Gee, oh yeah. my God, I know <laughs> English. This is, it sounds like I'm completely incapable of talking English sometimes. Uh, when you work with, uh, with uh, dying, Perhaps I would introduce it uh, in the in the way I I did it, ritualizing it, singing songs around it, introducing culture that has a spiritual element to it that has been connected to that activity previously. Because we've lost a lot of that in our craft activities today. Yeah, this is perhaps how I think. Uh, but going back fifty or hundred years, people would sing all the time when they were working people would make their work rhythmic. And of course we can reintroduce those things again and we can search for what in our culture are, have people done when they've uh, engaged in their uh, craft work. And just be take that as a point of departure and as an inspiration. Or you can tell, depends on, on, on a group of course, if you have a group of three uh, third graders who can actually sit still, uh, when they do their craft work, you can always uh, tell them a, a, a story while they're working and, and introduce things like that. Um, that is just off the top of my head. That's how I would think at least. Thank you so much, Rui. We have almost reached the end of our time. So you just answered one question by Martin Conrad. There is one question, there are other questions left. Maybe Guna has one and can put it. And after that, we have to finish. But I asked Laura to put in your email address in the chat. So if there are further questions, they might um, send you an email. Yeah. Oh, uh, hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, hi, Rian. Thanks for everything. I will make it really short. I think you've answered um, Johan and. Uh, um, the person after that answered a bit of the question, but I just want to know because PE itself and outdoor education, mm. do you think it complements craft? Because actually, what I want to know just a gist of it is: is it at the end of the day the artifact that comes out of the craft which is important? Because all the sensory motor skills can be gained in different different things. And although you say it's not the what you make or how you make, is it the why you make important as well? Yeah, yeah of course, of course. Yeah. So which is the one that differentiates craft? That's that's my simple question. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's you can always go in two directions. Here. You can say, in a sense, that all kinds of uh, physical activity are are fundamentally physical activity. I move my hands if I do, uh, or my body if I do yoga, just as much as I do if I weave. Uh, on the other hand, you can go in the opposite direction and say, look when you do weaving, this is different from doing bookbinding. And these different activities have their own special affordances that are important to the students. And so it really depends on what you're looking for in your argument at the moment. Sometimes it's important to emphasize the commonality. Sometimes it's just as important to emphasize the reason why we do all these different kinds of crafts. My I, I would say the most general uh, perspective I can offer on that is that when we have a diversity of students as we do in school, it's important to recognize that one student might be incredibly touched by uh, clay work 
and working on the turntable, making a bowl or, or a cup. Another student might be incredibly touched by physical education and doing volleyball, and that's where they develop and grow and experience meaningfulness. So I think if, if a d- education is supposed to be general, we have to recognize that meaningfulness for d- students is going to be very different from one student to the next. And we need as large of a, a plurality of variety as possible uh, so that we can reach all students potentially, where if we have just a, a single activity, we're going to reach some students, but far less than we would otherwise. Yeah. Thanks, you got to answer it perfectly. Thank you. Yeah, perfect. Great. So, yes, thank you so much, Rui. That was a really nice closing um, um, statement. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much. So yeah, we are... just, I mean, uh, sorry, to just uh, yes. add one thing to that is, it's basically the same thing as with human beings. A plural society, a society where many people of different uh, cultures and backgrounds coexist is much richer than a monochrome society. And the same has to be, uh, or is the case in education. We need a variety for that reason. And so I, that's, that's what I wanted to add. Wonderful, thank you. Hmm. Yes, we look forward um, to our next lecture that will be from Brazil um, this time, from Sao Paulo. It's Melanie Guerra e Maria do Camo. And the topic is Waldorf Pedagogy and the Idea of Shared Humanity by Amatia Sen. So we are really looking forward to the lecture from South America next Tuesday. Thank you to all of you. I wish you a good day, a good night. And um, thank you, Rui, so much for that presentation. We will upload the video very soon so that the people can see it again or um, see it for the first time. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank bye you bye. for the invitation. Good night. Thank you Thank very much. Bye bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Good night. Good night. <laughs>